All right, I guess we're ready to start. So thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. I know we're at the end of the conference. People are probably catching flights soon, but I love seeing so many people here. It's been an awesome conference. I really enjoyed it. I hope all you guys did. So yeah, I'm here today to talk about WireGuard and the future of cloud networking. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just a bit of info about me. So I'm Alex Feisley. Um, I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. It's a beautiful town if you've never been there. Um, you know, moved there during the remote work era. I love being there. We're a completely virtual team, so no reason to be in a hub anymore, in my opinion, at least. Um, yeah, in my personal life, I am a music hobbyist. I like making music on the computer and piano. I'm kind of terrible at guitar, but I try to do it a little bit if I can. Um, yeah, and my background, technically, I was at IBM as a DevOps engineer doing multi-cloud and data science infrastructure. I did similar stuff uh, with Crossvale, which is a Red Hat partner, so I got to do some really cool big projects there as well. Um, yeah, and then I went and founded NetMaker. So that's what I've been doing for a few years now. But that's not what the talk is about, so I'll get started talking about WireGuard. But NetMaker is a WireGuard virtual networking platform. Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit is VPNs, kind of the rise and demise of them in the popular mindset. Uh, we'll then go into what the new sort of popular mindset in the culture is uh, in the zero trust. Uh, we'll move on to WireGuard and how it changes the game in terms of how we think about VPNs. And then I'll give you a quick demo just of what WireGuard looks like in case you're not familiar with it. And we'll talk about where you can actually go to bring WireGuard into your organization and how you can start implementing it. Then we'll wrap up with a brief Q&A and uh, that'll be it. So, okay. Getting started, VPNs, what are they? I'm sure most of you guys are pretty familiar if you're in this talk, um, but just trying to keep it very simple and maybe get around some of the misconceptions of what a VPN is. So it's a virtual private network in its very simplest form. It's like encrypted tunnels between devices and typically creates secure connections over the internet. Um, so we have some thoughts around what a VPN is uh, conceptually, but in its simplest form, you could have just two devices. Each one has a virtual address on it, and it encrypts the traffic on device A, sends it over to device B, and there you go. That's a VPN, but it takes many, many other forms, obviously. So in terms of more popular conceptions of a VPN, there's you know kind of the private internet access thought around VPN, which is what most personal users probably think when they think VPN. So you have some provider, you are encrypting the data, sending it over to that provider, and then they forward it on to the internet for you. Um, very similarly, if you're in the corporate space, you're probably more familiar with a remote access VPN, which is basically the same thing, but rather than go to the internet, you're going to your corporate resources, whatever those are. Uh, encrypting the traffic on your device, going to a server, and then on into the corporate network. So those are kind of the two most common ones. But moving on from there, there's a lot of other different types of VPNs, different ways of implementing them. Um, they can take pretty much any arbitrary configuration to form whatever topology you're trying to create with your network. Um, so you probably heard site to site where you're mostly forwarding traffic between routers rather than to the end user devices so that site A can talk to site B and vice versa. And that can take many, many sites. Uh, or you could have something more modern like a mesh VPN. So this is less known, I think, in the popular mindset and also doesn't have really a fixed terminology yet because it's, I think, relatively new in the space. Um, so in this case, you still have that original thing of just device A talks to device B, but in this case, you have many devices and you're basically forming 
a subnet of those devices where each device has a direct connection to the other devices. So this can be very helpful if you're trying to form basically a virtual LAN between all of the devices wherever they are and not have to route through any additional devices. So a short timeline on kind of where it was popularly, I'd say the early 2000s, it was rising with the rise of the internet as people started using the internet more. Corporations realized, oh, we have to send data over the internet. Let's encrypt that, keep it safe. Uh, moving on into the 2010s, it gets more into commercial adoption. So you have more private VPNs showing up. People realize pretty much the same thing. We want to keep our data safe as it moves from our devices to the internet. Stop hackers, malicious actors, all that sort of stuff. And also, you know, uh, maybe you want to visit a website in uh, some country and it's not allowed in that country. So a good way to do that. And then moving on into kind of the current era is uh, we've seemed to move past VPNs, at least in the corporate space, uh, in terms of what we want to implement. Um, in the personal space, obviously still very, very popular and still pretty much used everywhere. Uh, at every corporation, you're going to have a VPN likely today. But um, when you get to the decision making side of things, uh, it's moved on a bit. And that pretty much, I would say, came from Zero Trust, which obviously is extremely important today. But as Zero Trust rose as a concept and a framework, we moved on to say that VPNs are now legacy. They're not dynamic. They're very difficult to configure. They're very static. Uh, they slow you down because they encrypt your traffic, uh, depending on how much compute they take up. Uh, you can get a lot of latency, so not good for high data transfer scenarios, and they're not secure. And that's really come out of the Zero Trust framework, which is, you know, perimeter security is not enough. You can't just encrypt traffic on devices because if someone compromises that device, you're no longer secure. Um, if the CEO of a corporation, if their device gets hacked um, and their VPN has access to everything, that person has access to everything. So. That's kind of why we've said, okay, VPNs are now old guard. We're moving on to more zero trust type products and frameworks. Um, and you see a lot of quotes like that all over, which is basically VPNs are now obsolete. Uh, as we move into the zero trust world, VPNs will no longer exist. So uh, just a short bit on zero trust here. So it's a framework for getting security down to a very, very fine level and making sure that every request is verified. So you're moving far past device level security. So you start from zero access and you build it up for every request and for every resource, whether that's an app or a server or a user, whatever they are, they all have an identity. Anytime they make a request, it gets verified you check their access controls, and only then do you move on to the resource. So that's basically the idea. And I want to talk a little bit about problems with Zero Trust. And it's not a problem with the framework. It's more about the implementation, because it is a big change for a lot of organizations. And it's a pretty difficult thing to implement. Um, Zero trust, in addition to being a framework, is a mindset and a culture shift, similar to like DevOps or Agile. You're not just putting zero trust into your organization. You are changing the way your organization thinks about security entirely. Beyond that, you're moving, you're putting the security on every single device and it touches everything that your business does. So to really do zero trust, it's a lot of effort. So that's not a problem of zero trust itself. It's more of a problem in how do we implement it? Because similar to DevOps, if you hire a DevOps engineer, that doesn't mean you're doing DevOps. You have to change your whole processes to implement it correctly. So I'm going to get back to that a little bit, but I want to move on to WireGuard, what it is, and what it enables. So 
WireGuard is a relatively new VPN protocol, not super new at this point, but new relative to other VPN protocols. Um, it's low level, so it allows you to create virtual interfaces on the device, but it's not doing a lot of, lot of higher level things. It's very small, very low level by design. Um, it's now Linux native. It's built into the Linux kernel. So if you're running any modern distribution, you're WireGuard enabled on that device by default. Also runs on Windows. You can put it on IoT embedded devices. It can go pretty much anywhere. And it's extremely fall, small, it's extremely fast. So if you configure it correctly, you can get a very similar latency that you could get to an unencrypted connection. Not exactly the same, but very close, which is fantastic. Um, and because it's low level and very simple, it's also extremely configurable. You can do a lot with it, which we'll talk about shortly. And it uses very, very modern encryption, which is also great. And particularly the asymmetric keys allow you to make sure that you're not just passing out a key and it has access to something. Um, you have to trade keys between devices, which gives you a much higher level of security between any devices. So, you know, if I steal a public key from somewhere, I'm not gonna have access to the resource. That resource must also have my public key in order to allow that access. So, a uh, brief history on WireGuard. Jason Donenfeld created it in 2015. Uh, it was very quickly realized to be a great protocol, something that could easily replace legacy VPNs. Uh, Linus Torvalds called it a work of art compared to previous VPN protocol implementations. So he worked very quickly to get it into the Linux kernel, which happened in 2020. Um, and from there, it got into pretty much every device you can imagine. So on FreeBSD, Mac, Windows, it can run across the board pretty easily. And there's user space implementations, Golang written implementations. So it's great and it's very ubiquitous. Um, not really in 2021, I just had to put a date there, but um, as WireGuard was found to be a very great protocol, people started to use it to do very interesting new patterns. So the Mesh VPN, people started using WireGuard to do that. It's also started to get built into some of these zero trust products as the way to secure the devices. Um, and getting to today, it's gotten to a pretty ubiquitous point. So, you know, if you're doing Kubernetes, CNIs can encrypt traffic over WireGuard now. Um, and a lot of the major VPN providers in the personal space have also shifted to using WireGuard. So it's getting to be pretty much everywhere, but it's still underneath, you know, I'd say the popular mindset. It's not uh, risen to the level of, let's say, uh, containers. Uh, so containers in the compute space. Um, you can think of how LXC kind of is, where most people don't really know what LXC is and how it enables all of these amazing things that we do. Uh, so how does WireGuard interact with this change in our mindset around VPNs? So VPNs are slow, VPNs are legacy, VPNs are very hard to configure and static, um, and most importantly, they grant too much access. So with WireGuard, you get extremely high speeds, it's extremely configurable and embedded in a lot of devices by default now. Um, because of the mutual key exchange, you do get a higher level of trust and it can complement zero trust, which is what I'm gonna get to next. It's not an either or scenario, it's something that can help with your implementations and or maybe be the first way that you go about it if you're starting out. Um, yeah, so WireGuard enables you to create very arbitrary networks. If you've got IoT devices in the field, if you've got a multi-cloud scenario, if you've got site-to-site, -site, WireGuard can be implemented in pretty much any of those. And it allows you to build a much more secure perimeter at the device level than you could previously because of how low level it is and because it's really about going device to device. Um, 
So with that, WireGuard is a great base layer for building a secure network. It's not going to be zero trust because it is at the device layer, but by starting with WireGuard, which is perhaps a lot simpler to implement, something you can implement on a case-by-case -case basis, it's a great way to start. With that, let's just do a real quick demo of what WireGuard looks like. So I've just got two devices here. Uh, I'll just log into those. Okay. So here I've got a server in New York and a server in Sydney. I want to securely access an API running on server B from server A. I don't want to expose that API or I don't want to bind that API to the public interface. Um, I just want to have it be secure over the VPN and not worry about it. So I have in here uh, the WireGuard config files already set up and I'm just going to show you what that looks like. Actually, I guess I'll cat that. That makes more sense. And this is kind of the quick way to get WireGuard up and running. It, WireGuard is actually run with, you know, more Linux native commands, but this is kind of, there's a helper script to let you get it up going quicker, but you'll see the commands it runs. And this can visually show you what a WireGuard setup looks like. So on server A, I have an address for it. So it's going to create a virtual interface with a IP address of 10.100.0.2. Um, I have defined a private key for this device, which I shouldn't be showing you guys, but there it is. <laughs> uh, and there is the listen port that is reachable over. And then I have to also define the peer that it is going to access because I need to know its public key and it needs to know mine. So I, in order to reach another device, I need to know its public key. I need to know the address to reach. I also, over the private network, what is its private network address? I also need to know its public network endpoint. So what's going to be the route over the internet to take in addition, the port. Oh, interesting. And I actually misconfigured that, but it still works. And I'll, I can explain that as well. Um, so same thing on the other one. So. They basically traded public keys. You have to take public key from one, put it on the other, vice versa, and add all this information in. So we'll do a quick WG quick up for those who are familiar with it on device A and device B. Oh, I don't want to do it down. And you can see the commands it's actually running there. So what it's doing is adding a new interface of type WireGuard. It is adding a IP address to that interface, uh, and it is adding a route for the other device. So I should be able to ping that. Let's find out. Okay, cool. And actually, so one of the good things with WireGuard is even though I got that port misconfigured there, as long as one device is able to reach the other device, then you can establish a connection and it keep, can keep going from there. So that endpoint could have been totally screwed up and they're still able to get to each other. Um, so now that I have that running, I'm just going to run a Docker container with a Hello World REST endpoint on it. Uh, so it's attached to that virtual interface. And so this isn't going to be reachable over the public. So if I, I think I have it in there. So if I try to ping it over this guy, that's not going to work, ideally. Not reachable. And then we ping over that private endpoint. And there you go. So that's like the tiniest, tiniest possible use case. It goes back to that original definition of what is a VPN, which at its smallest form, you've got two devices, private connection between the two with the private address on them. So that's that. And let me 
get back to here. Okay, so moving on from there, how can you go and take like something like this and put it into your organization or get started with it? Um, so the great thing about it is it's really easy to implement for small setups and easy to get going. Um, and it works across a very good variety of use cases. So site to site, if you're looking to put this on routers, uh, you can set that up in a matter of like an hour, just configuring it to put two routers together. You make a private tunnel like that uh, and you're good to go. Remote access, a little bit more work. Uh, so you're gonna probably create a gateway, but it could be remote access to a particular device. Um, and then overlay networks, you can also do something like that where you have a bunch of point to point connections. Obviously in that case, it starts to get a lot more complex. So let's say you have 10 devices or 100. Uh, if you look at those config files I created, imagine you have to know the endpoints of 100 different devices, the ports of them. Uh, imagine if any of those devices changes networks. Imagine if one of them is behind a CG NAT. Uh, it starts to get incredibly complicated when you go to scale. So we'll talk about that a little bit, but at least at the small level with these smaller setups, you can get going on your own pretty easily. So just looking at that a little bit as maybe an IT administrator, you've got a corporate landscape that includes a lot of different scenarios, traffic going between data centers, offices, clouds, machines, IoT devices. Um, and you know, you're starting trying to figure out where to get started with that but you don't have to go with everything all at once. You can say, okay, this needs access to this, this needs access to this, and start setting up those tunnels. Um, so it starts to get a little bit more simple, especially when you start thinking about it as what it is, which is a virtual network. So you've now created this perimeter where the devices have access to just what they should have access to, which is great. But, there are limitations on WireGuard because it is low level. WireGuard is very small and simple by design, which is fantastic. It should be. Uh, but because of that, it hasn't built in a lot of the things that you are probably looking for if you're implementing network security. You don't have a concept of identity. You don't have a concept of sessions. So I created those tunnels. Those are going to be alive until I kill them. Um, you know, it's not at the service level, it's at the device level. So if you're trying to secure just an API, you know, you probably want some more firewall rules around that. You want it to be about specific ports. Uh, and there's no discovery or automation built into it. So like I showed with setting up those config files, it's gonna be a lot of work if you start going to scale. Um, and the most important part, which is why zero trust is so important, is it does not account for compromised devices. So if you get access to one of these devices inside of WireGuard network, it's still going to be able to access the other devices. Luckily, there are solutions that allow you to start building on WireGuard and to implement these more complex concepts. So some have already been built by various companies, uh, but there's also a lot of open source projects that let you get going. So if you're looking to do this a organization, you can probably find some form of automation that lets you get going. I've talked to a lot of people who use Terraform or Ansible to generate these config files and push them out to devices, and it works great for them. And for a lot of people, that's gonna be the right solution. So that is fantastic as well. So going forward into what you really want to get to is you have this very, very secure perimeter, which you can build very easily with WireGuard, where devices have access to just the devices that they should have access to. And on top of that, you're adding on a layer of identity and of sessions where you're able to make sure that if something goes, well, not if something goes wrong, when something goes wrong, that devices or that identities only have access to the things that they should have access to, that things get expired, that things get kicked out. Um, so that's really what you're building towards, but you can start with this very, very simple implementation. So, okay, made very good time there. So wrapping up on Q&A and takeaways, let's do a quick bit here. So, 
yeah, VPNs used to be the thing um, with the rise of zero trust and other frameworks. Uh, VPNs are now considered in at least the popular mindset to be legacy, but they're still a very important thing as a form of device level security. Uh, and the WireGuard protocol is the way to do that going forward. It is the embedded way of doing this on Linux. It's extremely fast, it's efficient, and it just makes sense. So that's pretty much what I've got for you guys. Uh, my name is Alex Feisley. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. I left probably too much time for questions, but that's totally fine. Um, before we do, I want to do one thing that's really fun. So um, NetMaker is a project uh, that's built on top of WireGuard that is currently on the SSPL license, which is no good. Um, so today we're going to just go ahead and switch that over to Apache. So I'm going to go here and find that pull request. Oh, look, there it is. Hey, Abhishek, is it squash and merge or do I do the other one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. All right, there we go. That maker's open source now. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> So thank you guys, happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> sure. So, oh, great, okay. So I, I'm currently using Tails, by the way, I'm not terribly network sophisticated, so if this is stupid, make up for it. Um, I use Tailscale currently, I'll be checking this out for sure, but Tailscale has the, so one thing I just noticed is like a lot of what I get out of Tailscale is automating all that stuff that you just showed mm -hmm. in terms of the config and stuff, and that's cool. But so there's the idea of being able to configure an exit node. Mm -hmm. um, is that about WireGuard or is that some additional magic on the side? That's a little bit of additional magic. So in that case, you're exiting, it's called an exit node because that's where the traffic exits. Yeah. So it is unencrypted at that point and then forwarded on to the wherever you're going from there. So that can be very simple forwarding rules. So for instance, if you're doing this with pure WireGuard, I could have set that up on machine B like I did there. So for instance, it's in a VPC. So I could have added an additional address to that, which is the VPC address, and then put a firewall rule that just says, once the traffic gets here, forward it to the VPC. And then device A is now able to reach device B's VPC using that as the exit node. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, got one more there. Uh, if we have time, could you Tell us more about uh, NetMaker. Yeah, I, I don't. I, yeah, I didn't want to be like a corporate guy just pushing our own thing. But um, yeah, so we're really an automation layer on top of WireGuard, meant to do the sort of things that I talked about. So, for instance, well, let's talk about the architecture a little bit. So, you think about Kubernetes. You have a control plane and you have nodes, and on the control plane you have an API and you're declaratively saying, this is what my cluster should look like. Um, this should be created here, this should be created here, this should be changed like this. So we do something very similar where we have a control plane, which is the server. It also has a nice little UI so you can log in, um, but you can all do it over API as well. And you create networks on side, inside of that platform. So for instance, you create various subnets and then you create keys for joining the network. Our agent then registers with the network 
It generates a private key on the device, sends the public key to the server, so you're never exposing the public key. Uh, and then once the agent's running, it's able to handle this sort of discovery aspect. So, for instance, it reaches out to a stun endpoint to determine its public endpoint and tells the server, hey, this is where I live. This is where I'm reachable. And then the server pushes out that to all the other devices in the network so they know where to reach it in addition to the public key. So by default, it's creating a mesh VPN. So it's basically a subnet of all of your devices, which could be in multiple clouds, data centers, IoT devices. You have one private subnet where they can all reach each other. But on top of that, it adds in things like access controls, where if you think of you know, that thing with the um, tunnels there, where is that? Do, do, do. Right, so this is what it's building by network by default, but then you can also say, uh, I don't want that tunnel anymore. Let's click that one off or that one. Uh, so you're able to define which devices have access to which other devices directly. And then you can also do things like you mentioned with an exit node, you declare one machine as an exit node. It then sets up the firewall rules to say, all right, this machine down here is in AWS. I want the other machines in the network to be able to access the VPC. So for the traffic into there. So that was all very technical. Um, in terms of like practical use cases, I think for 90% of people today, their use cases tend to be remote access. So it makes setting up a remote access situation very easily. So you put point A, point B, make it exit into that network. Boom, you've got remote access using WireGuard. So that's just a simple use case, but it allows you to create, I guess, infinitely complex topologies for your networks. I have a question on the scalability of WireGuard. So let's mm -hmm. say I have 64 hosts and I want a full mesh so mm -hmm. all the hosts can talk with each other. Yeah. Would that work by default or are there some tweaks I have to do? No, it's super efficient on the routing side. So uh, 64 is not even slightly a problem. I think when you start getting into the tens of thousands of devices, you might have to think about it a little bit, but... Um, yeah, until that point, there's not really any concern with scalability. Sure. Uh, what is your feedback regarding uh, issues that you could have since, because it's built uh, within the kernel, mm -hmm. whenever you have an issue, it's a bit difficult to identify mm. uh, comparing to, to, to other uh, tools which produce classical uh, logs. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in my case, it is uh, deployed, it works well, mm -hmm. but sometimes for strange reason, <laughs> it fails and it, 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 I can only solve the problems with a, a simple restart. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's yeah. very fair. And um, so it's worth mentioning while WireGuard is built into the Linux kernel, uh, and it, actually they also have a kernel version for Windows, which is really cool. Um, they also have a user space version. So actually that's a decision point that you as the administrator have to make because the kernel version is more efficient, but the user space version is more secure. So for instance, Tailscale, they, I believe by default, use a user space implementation of WireGuard. Um, so by doing that, you're able to lock down I'm not really talking about issues with connectivity here. I'm just talking about security. I'd say that's really the main consideration with running kernel WireGuard is you do need to run it in the kernel, which gives you a lot more permissions than maybe you might want, but you can run it in user space as well. Um, yeah, I, maybe that didn't answer your question, but just addressing some of the things about kernel versus non-kernel. <laughs> Sure. Is there a difference in philosophy between, say, it's really quick, between, say, Tailscale, your NetMaker, and some of the others, like, or is it just, well, here's the features we built, here's the features we built? Yeah, um, yeah, and I don't want to, you know, get in too much of a corporate matchup or anything like that, but <laughs> I'd say, uh, in general, uh, NetMaker is a self-hosted platform. We do also have a SaaS version, if you don't like to set up infrastructure. Um, but the real value there is all of the data is on your infrastructure. 
uh, that's, that's primarily the value. Um, so I know some people, just for compliance reasons, they don't want to have a SaaS running their VPN. Uh, so I'd say that's the main thing. The one other thing is I'd say we are built for more technical people, I'd say. Um, it's much more about uh, configuring exactly how you want your network to be defined. You know, you set ports, you set endpoints uh, if you want, um, and lots of other little configurations, whereas I think maybe I'm not going to speak for TailScale or anything, but you know, they definitely have a much uh, nicer, more hide away those aspects user experience where you don't really have to know what WireGuard is to run it. You're just running a VPN. So yeah, there's definitely, and there's other products because um, I, I don't want to, you know, put us out there. So like uh, Zero Tier is not built on WireGuard. They have their own protocol, but it is still very efficient. I believe it's built on noise, which is similar. Um, so they're also a very good one for building these kind of modern VPN type networks. And there's a few others in the space. Um, so, you know, there, I, I think each one has maybe a little bit of a specialty on what you're focused on. Any other questions? Cool. Well, if not, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference, which I think is about done at this point, but I hope you have a good trip home and uh, thanks for listening to my talk. <laughs>